Thank you very much, Dr. Surasi. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Biocheck, for allowing me to spend some time here to share some of the good experience of the best practices for frog health monitoring. Well, perhaps uh, this name, frog health monitoring, had been uh, mentioned by many, many people uh, years ago. Still, we always find there are rooms for improvement. That's just the reason why today we are coming here to discuss and to share some experience and see whether it can be applied in your company or not. Well, today we had a very long list of high tea uh, of the best practices. So you can see uh, we have many strategies, okay? Hopefully you can apply and I'm going to share with you one by one. So buckle your seatbelt and start the journey. Looking into broiler breeder, it's a very long life animal. From day one until 64 weeks, sometimes it can extend to 70 weeks, okay? So you can see that the functions of the broiler breeder is to produce healthy offspring. Of course, themselves need to be healthy as well. So you can see that formulating a very effective and good uh, so-called frog health monitoring program will be very important for us to ensure this, okay? Looking into the production casket, okay, or flow chart or pyramid, you can see that one grandparent will be producing about 40 parents. So if you have 7,500 then you will get about 300 over parents and moreover to broilers is about close to 48 million. So we are propagating the offspring, okay? Likewise, if you have problem from the top, you will actually unintentionally produce the problem as well. So what are we going to strategize it? Basically, we want to spend small money to prevent losing big money. I very often observe company in Asia is not even willing to spend small money. But when they lose big money, they will say this is act of God. Okay, so think about it. Well, from Frog health monitoring strategy itself is more clinked into preventive medicine rather than acting to solve problem when the problem is already erupted. So what we want to strategize here is based on two major uh, strategy. We call it proactive and active. So the approach is far more different from what we used to. In the past, we always say, okay, we want to have a program. Okay, this is this, is this. Based on the program, we execute, okay, the monitoring. Now, in this afternoon or evening to you, we want to have a proactive approach. Looking into the proactive approach, against the timeline, against the uh, disease or chronology of the disease, we can find that we are more in control and least damages will be resulted. That's why uh, we need to be different in this approach. I'm going to show you what is the uh, motive of proactive. Instead of hunt, I mean, uh, having an old program that you follow, why don't we hunt for the risk, okay, that happening around us or even present in our farm, but it have, haven't uh, show problem. So this is uh, another approach that we never think about in the past, okay, which is we go for environmental check or even the vermins that are potential bringing disease to us, let's look for the risk. 
This is called proactive. So in the rest of the uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about how do we hunt for the virus or bacteria? We also talk about ad hoc testing. Whenever you feel that there is a risk coming in, act on it, be proactive, okay? So followed by active uh, surveillance, that is more what we had been practicing in the past, okay? We had a program, we just followed the program, something our program, we never, never think about it. So this is so-called active. So we need to hold very strong on the active and perfect it. From time to time, we always think that we are not good in our program designing. We perfect it. So you will have version one, version two, okay, towards the year and keep on um, making it more relevant to the field uh, condition. Last but not least, when you have no idea of what is your risk or threat, what can you do? Basically, you can keep the samples for future tests, okay? This is so-called retrospective study. For example, if you don't realize something is happening, but you're afraid something may happen later on, always there is a strategy I'm going to show you later. And of course, Whenever there's a disease outbreak, you test for the etiology agent to confirm a disease. This is also categorized as reactive. To understand what test or what monitoring choice that we can utilize, we need to have some immunology uh, knowledge. I think by now, everybody know what is rapid uh, test kit, what is a PCR test, what's, what is antibody test, because COVID already gives us a very, very good lectures since 19, 2019. So you can, you, we can skip this graph because everybody see this graph almost uh, every other day. So strategy number one or best practice number one, you must know what happened in the farm or in the company before, you need to have a biosecurity risk assessment system for you to know where you are, okay? So normally, like Avigen, we had a checklist, okay? From, uh, we're giving uh, an ID, and then we will score the farm, the location, the frog, or even the whole practice from history, you can see there is different scoring here, 1,100. The more risk, we give it higher score. If you find some very serious disease had happened, we give it a higher score because we think your risk will be higher. You will tend to have problem later. So follow through the assessment you'll find that we zoom into the farm or location or the people, the farm physical condition, the animal itself, and all other practices. So you can see actually the element of biosecurity in terms of structural, operational, and the whole conceptual are actually embedded inside the risk assessment. So from there, what can we find? is actually a score. If you score very healthily, uh, very low, then the biosecurity consider okay, then your frog health monitoring program can be designed into a way that it will be suit to your condition. If you score very high, most likely you may need to abandon the farming project or you need to have double up your biosecurity um, security kind of uh, control, not forgetting your frog health monitoring program perhaps will be very, very complicated and it still cannot guarantee the success of not getting your frog into, succumbs into disease. 
So as I mentioned, in terms of passive or really reactive kind of approach of frog health monitoring, you still can do something. Whenever you receive a frog, you have no idea they were having problem or not. It's always good to have a practice to keep the serum every five weeks, okay? Keep some sample if you are not confident of your field diagnosis. Or actually, you can also do the feed sample as well, just to be sure, because problem will not happen overnight. It will happen maybe a week later or two. So always, if you keep the serum, keep the samples, you are able to look back what's have been going on. Like people have been uh, talking about COVID-19 traceability. Uh, people go to the uh, blood bank, okay, to check for the antibody, same concept, okay? Um, Avigen also come out with some very good uh, literature to guide you on how you can collect sample. So in this case, uh, you can go to the website and download the document. This is about uh, FDA card uh, sample collections. And always be remind that keep the FDA card in refrigerated condition because we had uh, some researcher proven and also my own experience, some RNA virus do not survive well in the FDA card even overnight or over two weeks or something like that, if you store it in a higher temperature. Now we need to shift our paradigm. In the past, we always think, ah, Marek's vaccination difficult to monitor. You only see the clinical sign when the frog is getting uh, laying stage, okay? That is not totally uh, right because you can actually monitor the vaccine take by feather pup collections and perform a PCR. Well, in this paper written by Isabel Jimeno, she demonstrated one week later of post-vaccination, you will find uh, positive detections in the individual bird, okay? But um, from my own experience here, normally you need to have about 10 to 14 days when you pull the feather pup and you need to test it individually, don't mix with other birds. One bird, one PCR test, you can go for five to 10 PCR tests that will be good representative for the whole frog. And very often I found the uh, improvements is always very, very interesting to me. Number one, when you always monitor this, your supplier will tend to perform a better hatchery Marex vaccination. Okay, so this is a very good monitoring system that you will prevent future losses. Okay, this is strategy one. Okay, so let's look at the uh, post vaccinations, for example, for IBV, infectious bronchitis. In the past, there are strategies of monitoring by ELISA method. Having said that, ELISA method takes longer time to develop, especially uh, at the very young age, um, the frog had been sprayed by IV uh, at hatchery, okay? So it will take about at least five to six weeks to see some title, and sometimes the title is not really that clear. What can we do if we don't have a very good uh, indication? Well, we can go for PCR. Okay, individual bird, how do we perform a PCR? So you need to have a tracker swap from each sampling of different location, just get 10, okay? Per 50,000 bird will be good enough. And put it for PCR. You will find that in case you get eight out of 10 is positive, that is a good indication that most of the frog are actually uh, having good vaccine take. 
and also you will expect no problem. If less than that, you need to really uh, put on uh, feedback to the hatchery itself. So not only looking at uh, color dye in the hatchery spray, but also PCR seven days post vaccination. People may ask me, hey, this is a vaccine or this is a virus from the field. No problem, go for sequencing. Nowadays, sequencing is not really that expensive. From time to time, you can do it for monitoring, not only for diagnosis. Another example, if we further extend this monitoring system to hatchery spray and followed by drinking waters at day 21, you still can check seven days post vaccinations for their uniformity. So this is something I will like you to try your own and you will know the benefit because in order to wait for serology, you need to see a quick vaccine uh, replication. This is more uh, useful in the priming or in the early stage of the broiler breeder or even broiler. But how about later on? Of course, if you want to evaluate Q or inactivated vaccine, you always need to apply ELISA test. Okay. Okay. So, mycoplasma is also another very headache uh, kind of etiology agents for breeder as well. Because as a breeder, we do not want to produce mycoplasma positive offspring. So how do we control it from the beginning? Okay, again, beside ELISA, we can do PCR. Let's look at the PCR test in case of the day old chicks. So you can either pull them together or you can uh, test them individually. It's up to you because this is, the objective is to identify the positive rate. So it is not post-vaccinated. So you can pull it, maybe five birds per sample or three birds per sample or individual, it's up to you. And then you go for PCR test. Well, there's an example of some survey in um, the Philippines, we had sample, okay, house B1, B2, and B3 from the same supplier of the OC. And unfortunately, the house was all positive for MS and mostly positive for MG as well. So we know that we have a poor start. So what can we do? Well, this was um, managed by a farm manager. Immediately, he ordered some antibiotics. And of course, in this study, the, the initial objective is not to demonstrate uh, antibiotics uh, efficacy, just to demonstrate the uh, presence of mycoplasma. But since it's positive, okay, we are medicating it. And also, after seven days, we check it again by PCR. We are so lucky this time, uh, probably because of the uh, vertical transmission issue is not really heavy. And also um, the strain was uh, quite susceptible to doxycycline. We able to contain it. And the subsequent week, there is no positive detection. So this is very lucky. We are not always that lucky. Um, another example in Taiwan. Well, MG positive, all the houses, MS all negative, but we are not really that lucky after uh, antibiotics treatment. We still can find some houses we have positive uh, example. So what do this tell us? Actually, if we can utilize PCR to evaluate 
the day old chick quality and also post antibiotics treatments efficacy we are more we have more weapons in our hand in combating mycoplasma talking about this uh, somebody just come up with uh, um, like summary if we detect it earlier maybe we can control it better rather than waiting it to have problem so now today with um, you know pcr cost is affordable i think uh, we can utilize it more frequent compared to the older days how about environmental check immediately people will start thinking about oh culture okay or maybe something like um, atp detection something like that yeah culture is possible but very time consuming okay and also there are many failure from the culture because when you transfer a sample with the transfer media with the uh, transferring uh, temperature and the day going to the lab most likely the etiology agent will not survive but it survived very well in the chicken so what do you want to know from the environment is actually the presence of salmonella or mycoplasma so if we cannot culture or we think culture is very tedious so what can we do okay of course you can see how tedious is it pcr pcr can help you like for example salmonella salmonella species primers can detect all the salmonellas so it can detect any salmonellas on any surfaces even in the hatchery or even in the dead itself or uh, from the hatchery okay? or the dead bird or sick bird okay especially not forgetting meconium in terms of the meconiums in the hatchery people practicing um, when sexing okay so one bucket of meconium will be representing the whole day uh, in the morning um, the samples so if you perform culture or pcr if there is a positive detection it will pretty indicating where the problems come from either it's come from certain uh, known uh, breeder frog or even farm okay sometimes one hatchery serve two farms that's why but well, anyway this is a researcher they done in uh, company a and b you can see by using pcr they can demonstrate a uh, positive rate okay that will be very important uh, kind of uh, benchmarking compared to company b here you can see that is proactive approach they check the mice they check the dead bird and run a pcr on it so this is a very good practice of hunting for the etiology agent and one place that i'm always favorite to go is processing plant imagine you can do 200 chickens post mortem a day you will be dead okay you'll be so tired but in in case of you are collecting samples from the carcass rinse okay you will know the whole company uh, salmonella status straight away so when people ask me why my salmonella control program failed yes because you're using the old method the salmonella now is year 2021 version and you are still using 1990s version frog health monitoring program um, comparing culture and qpcr you can see the sensitivity of the qpcr is outrageous yeah and also not forgetting be proactive check the worm means that present around your farm so with that you can be very very sure what diseases are actually coming or actually present in the farm but it haven't shown clinical sign so this is very important 
um, parameters or step that you can uh, practice. How about MGMS PCR environmental uh, evaluation? Yes, the answer is, is very, very useful. Even in 21 years ago, people already think about it, but nobody really practicing it. When I go to my customers from uh, Korea to Pakistan, I don't see many people do that. And they always complain to me their frog have MGMS. Okay, that is too late. Okay, so why don't we start to be proactive? Checking in a different location from uh, drinking water all the way to uh, environment, then you will know better what's going on actually in the farm. Whenever you find you need to ad hoc checking, go for it. Yeah, swaps, okay. And then you can go for this uh, PCR test. And this is a very good example when you, um, before cleaning and disinfections, okay, you can see there are some positive, okay? So after cleaning and disinfections, you can always check and demonstrate whether you need to redo the cleaning and disinfectant or this house is good to get the new intake. So this is one very important thing uh, that never people never really practicing it, but I can see now maybe three to five company in Asia start to do it because they want to control mycoplasma and salmonella or even, uh, even influenza check before check in. Okay. Every time when I go to a hatchery or farm, I always receive the toilet. From the toilet index or toilet cleanliness, I can almost judge or guess what will be the salmonella index in the company. It's always not far from accurate. Okay? So dirty hatchery, dirty toilet, dirty uh, products, high salmonella. Okay? Another way how I'm going to guess what will be the disease pressure or maybe biosecurity score is to ask them, what is the disinfectants that you're using? How much? Tell me. Actually, from the price of the disinfectants, from the quality, I almost can guess they are having high risk or low risk. Don't use cheap disinfectants because they don't kill the virus effectively or bacteria effectively and they give you problem. So come to some of the active frog health monitoring and blend with some proactive approach. I come up with something here. In serology, day old checks is always important to check some diseases. I just mentioned a few, but you can add on the list, okay? And after six to eight weeks of age, that will be the first, uh, the second monitoring for first priming vaccinations or perhaps priming plus inactivated uh, vaccines. So all these first day, six to eight weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, or every 10 weeks, are actually quite flexible to be amended from time to time because we thought some country may have higher pressure of disease or depending on the biosecurity risk assessment just now, then you need to, from time to time, add on the monitoring items. Okay, So sometimes uh, after salmonella vaccinations, people may tend to monitor the titles, but for that, I don't, do not put it in because I think uh, the serology response and the salmonella titles could be a very debatable area. Okay. I see many people utilize PCR in disease uh, occurrence. 
But now, maybe after this talk, you will start utilizing PCR for monitoring uh, purposes. So we can afford PCR, but we cannot afford a disease. Okay, so always discuss with your veterinarian, go for a PCR test to hunt for the etiology agent. Well, I make this slide maybe uh, 15 to 18 years ago, I can't remember. From the eye of uh, uh, veterinarian, if we want to look for good serology tests, okay, to understanding, to understand the, the disease conditions or even post vaccinations, seroconversion related to immunological response, all this, we always want to look into few major components. Number one, of course, is yourself because you are the one who manage the whole uh, frog health monitoring. You must have good history and also biosecurity assessment so that you know where you are, you know where you want to look for. Okay. And um, I also have some uh, experience with uh, biotech many years ago, looking into the laboratory that handle the test. They must have very good practices, internal quality control, high discipline, and also work as a very professional kind of um, service to the industry. Okay. Last but not least, test kit. I want to select a test kit that I have full confidence, well recognized, okay, and able to perform all the time within my expectation so that I can utilize it to solve my problem, okay? Talking about good serology tests, I am always looking for highly accurate and precision because I want to know the real situation. But in real life, we are not perfect, okay? Nothing is perfect in this world because it's created by a human. But we can always find a better one. Okay? So a good test system or test kit always can be your confidence because they always have good quality system embedded in the test. For example, you can see how many years ago this slide, okay? We have internal control in each test. During that time, it's R6. I think now it's R13, R14. I can't remember. Anyway, if you have reference control in your system, you can trust the result. This has always been stressed in the industry. And in case you are not satisfied, you want to have more internal control or external control, yes, please go along with, you know, discuss with your test kit supplier. But in Biotech, we already supply this for you with very good uh, reference control range for you to refer. And you will test and get the result and trust the result without any uh, worries. Okay. A good test kit is always worldwide uh, recognized and also is stable all the time, no matter you test it in Africa or, or Canada. Okay. So, what do we demonstrate here is the same test kit, the same sample, if distributed worldwide, test by different laboratory and gather all the information, you can always be sure that this test kit will be good or not after a statistically analysis. And here, this lab 217 seems may have some deviation from the most of the, the rest of the people. And this will be a very good practice from time to time to benchmark, okay, your laboratory or even the test kit company to benchmark their customer, okay? Benchmarking, and comparing the, the customer's lab from one to the other is very important, okay? You cannot have one test kit uh, for SPF chickens 
uh, tested high titer in certain country. Okay, this is unacceptable. So we cannot have enough uh, stress on the word baseline. You can see even uh, before this uh, meeting started, almost I found the video of biochecks explain all the contents of my talk. Okay, they're talking about baseline, comparing the abnormal to the normal. Okay. This is a very important pre-alarming system, could be so-called proactive and also active. Okay, so we need to utilize the data. I also experienced some cases where, yes, titles already not in the normal range, but allowing to be happening. Let's have a look in some country. Do not Clamp all the information into one where you cannot interpret. Try to find a way for you to understand or, in, I mean, uh, rearrange information up to a way that you can see over the weeks. Some things go down, some things go up. Okay. So, in case of flock one, two, three, you can see something very strange for flock one and flock three. Whereas a frog two looks a little bit normal, but it goes to another extreme somewhere here. So you need a very good veterinarian knowing the past history relate to the vaccination program. Okay. And then looking into the current result and start to analyze it. Okay. I always say utilize the data, not keep the data. Data, if you keep it, it's just like a decoration. It's just nothing to serve in helping the frog health monitoring program. So I like to see this graph and I like to interpret it for future disease prevention or even vaccination um, audit or vaccination change. Okay, so it can be utilized in many ways. Ah, this is very interesting. Baseline two, something very wrong here. So this frog actually experiencing very early IBV challenge. Okay, we cannot have title at this age, but it shows something wrong. So we always want to be alert when it out of the normal range. Ah, this is ND. Something wrong here. Don't know why. Okay, sometimes when you find the title is out of range, you can either do a pair serum, you can check it next to it to see whether if it's just an incidental finding or something goes wrong. Okay, so you can see data over time is very important way of interpreting or even the mortality uh, numbers over time, like every day you, you swap your handphone to see every day how many people die, uh, looking at the graph after the vaccine is available, still how many people die, that kind of graph. So I know that at this uh, pandemic era, everybody become epidemiology expert. See? Okay, this is, looks a little bit normal, but still be vigilant if sometimes the titles can be a little bit low, okay? So people may go for not only serology at this point, but let's do some PCR. Don't forget, you still have another weapons in your hand, PCR. Run it. A PCR test doesn't cost much compared to an IB in infection here or even during the production. So. Whenever you find something very strange in serology, use PCR. Ah, this is a very old slide written by myself many years ago. I thought, you know, if we want to perform a good ELISA test, you need to have good sample, good sample in, good result out. Okay. 
if you can't collect the samples at the right time, collect a couple of samples, compare it. And at that time, I don't have a chance to, uh, you know, um, utilize PCR much because many years ago, but now it's affordable. And also, when you select a test kit, okay, always knowing your test kit better by communicating with the test kit uh, representative to know what your test kit capable to do for you, what quality system they have, what lab they are running the test for you, and also how to interpret the result. You cannot spend all the money and then you get a result you cannot interpret. Although sometimes you cannot interpret at the point, but you still can interpret it later on. Baseline, as mentioned, compared to lab, as mentioned just now, okay? one thing, we as a web, we need to have logical thinking or even reasoning because when we see a very awkward kind of result, we are actually looking into a normal distribution curve. Okay? There will be somebody who are very extreme and also somebody who are also very extreme to the other end. So when you talk about um, protection, ELISA is a reference. It doesn't say everything because don't forget in immunology, there are still local immunity and other stuff going on. Okay. And very important practices that I starting to influence people to do and Avigen also starting to encourage people to do. And I can see towards five years from now, there will be more and more. But five years ago, I only see a handful in the North America. In Asia, almost the whole Asia, less than five people or five companies, they are running it. Okay. So what does, we, what does it about? Okay. So basically, every post-mortem that you perform, you need to document it and come up with a percentage or numbers, okay? Like let's say you are cutting out 10 birds, okay? Three have trachitis, maybe two have pneumonia, five have egg yolk peritonitis. Gather the information. When you gather the information enough, you will find you create a database. This database will be very important for you to formulate your fraud health monitoring program, okay? Or also knowing your risk assessment, was it coming along with what you see in the field, okay? All these numbers are very, very uh, precious for you because the chickens do not die without any reason, okay? So it must have something that making the mortality higher in certain percentage. From there, we can formulate a better management strategy or even we can improve our ventilation or we can do something else. So in the rearing, it could be more related to coccidiosis than we fix the coccidiosis. Okay? Maybe we need to uh, monitor the OSIS per gram post-vaccination, or maybe sometimes the second cycles, third cycles was interrupted by wrong uh, management practice, or something happens in the uh, litter quality, or maybe the humidity of the farm had influenced poor coccidial cycle, that kind of situation. In the laying period, if something happens like peritonitis, pack out, or maybe double yolk or prolapse, this is not an infectious disease. 
It could be our management. It could be poor uh, uniformity into lay, or it can be pushing the bird too hard, too, I mean, too much feed increment from uh, week 20 to week 25. Or could be lighting the frog too early, that kind of situation. So sometimes we are not dealing with infectious diseases. Okay? So with the mortality survey, we are able to strategize and also fine tune our management. This is another example. Okay? So you can see what is important, what is least important. And this is another one. So from here, all these informations will be translated into big data. Later on, it will help us to identify what we can do in the future to prevent the problem. If we able to gather all the information from 2019, last year, this year, perhaps we can forecast what will be coming to us next year. So this is the way how we utilize data, even without very high-end statistical analysis, we can forecast. So please utilize these techniques to help your company. Definitely, if you can know the future, you are more in control, you are winning compared to the others. Well, you can see in the video just now, we're talking about data. And now I think we are entering artificial intelligence era. The machines are actually learning and learning. The veterinarians in future, they will be smarter than the fresh graduate. And most likely we, a very uh, applic I mean the, the the apps that in the cell phone can help us to somehow recognize the image or video in the chickens farm or even in the postmortem pictures to give us the diagnosis. But that is not the end because we already have facial recognition uh, database. Okay, I know uh, one strong country, big country in China, uh, in, in Asia called China. They have developed quite far already. I think very soon uh, that can be applied in poultry, in ruminant, uh, maybe in other uh, field to help us in managing the health or even something else. So this is a very important uh, milestone. And I can see even speech recognition, like there are few papers already been published that they're able to analyze the vocalization of the chickens and related to disease, okay? So we are looking into that we're starting to understand the chicken uh, language, okay? The real language, okay? Speak recognition. So this is, uh, this era is already coming. It's, it's not will come, it's already coming. That's why uh, we need to be prepared. So all this big data, as I mentioned just now, will be slowly translate or even quickly translate into um, so-called the um, basis of artificial intelligence and also as a material for the machine to learn. Okay. So all this information, as I mentioned, it will go in the cloud. It will be linked with all the machinery, hatchery, farm, processing into a final database. So in the cell phone of the CEO, they can know real time what is going on. Maybe it will fresh red as, you know, 
uh, avian influenza positive in the environment, in what locations straight away, or maybe from the serology find, findings, there are some results already being posed straight away to the production manager immediately, like uh, what was shown in the um, uh, video just now, the bear system, they are capable to do that. Um, here, I would just want to, I mean, show a few uh, very powerful tools from Biocheck. Actually, many years ago, they already started uh, the concept of gathering all the information, facilitating the um, interpretation, and not forgetting to analyze and create a good baseline. Okay, so you can see individually or multi-flock uh, informations are uh, presented very, very clear and also very graphical. That's why you can see in one glance what is normal, what is abnormal. So this is a very, very good information or maybe good system that what you can call uh, to work with. Okay. When you compare multi flock just like what I showed just now, that is always very important to have a system that can create an alarming kind of uh, notification. I haven't seen that much in individual uh, information unless during the production, I mean the discussion, we identify it. So I believe there will be a system or already here, it will come up with something wrong. Like for example, VI interpret high or maybe um, CV interpret very low, that kind of things, okay? So you can see something stick up very high here, something wrong, okay? So all this must be, you know, manage or even uh, compute into a way that it will give you warning. We want the warning. Okay. Baseline setup is still very, very, I think, um, not well practiced across Asia region. I service so many customers. They tested the, the frog periodically or following uh, so-called schedule, but never utilize it until it is a, you know, a functioning uh, baseline. So from here, I would like to urge everybody to start working on it. Go back to your big pile of uh, result, get the information out, transfer it into data and set up the baseline. If you have difficulties in setting up the baseline, contact us or biochat, okay? Always need to set up, utilize data. In the past, there will be more uh, information utilized in case of a uh, Gamboro or IBD disease um, that we need to predict the vaccination day, okay? I know that there are somebody still using it. I think it's still very relevant and useful where Biotech already um, come out with a program or apps that able to perform these tasks so that you will know what is the best day for vaccination. And not forgetting, whenever you have result or data, if you can export it out and maybe analyze it in a different platform, it will give you a different perspective or paradigm then you will able to get more uh, prediction or even you can evaluate the, the past. So all this got to be run with very, very good uh, programmer. And I believe your supplier may able to help you. Here just a uh, you know, cascade of uh, different, different software. And I think uh, a good ELISA or PCR 
uh, test kit company must not only improve the, their hardware, but they need to improve the software side by side so that the prop help monitoring will be a success. Okay, so last but not least, I just gather it into a thinking process of uh, flowchart. I think uh, this is just a combination of hardware and software and how to blend it, utilize it, okay? So that in future, we may able to assign it to the computer system for more uh, better kind of control, no more human emotion, no more uh, preference, but it must be very scientific, okay? So just for today, I want to also remind that PCR ELISA are tools. We are human. We need to be the one who decide or diagnose what is the problem or disease. So whether this is a disease or this is a common issue or this is a uh, you know, vertical transmitted disease or something else, you need to rule in and rule out and form your differential diagnosis. So all these need to be, you know, uh, practice and come up with some certain uh, logistic kind of uh, approach before you ask uh, uh, Eliza. Okay, so all this must be considered, you know, before you have to go for uh, laboratory diagnostic or maybe frog health monitoring. You must know why you formulate or design that program. So all this must be uh, done by people who have experience and also have the targets or objective. Then only you can formulate a relevant kind of frog health monitoring program. Okay, so with that, I just want to wrap up the talk. We need to shift our paradigm. Okay? We need to be proactive. Okay? And don't underuse the data that you uh, obtain towards the years. You need to start using it and to be winning the frog health monitoring program, you need to practice the above suggest uh, strategy. And I think you will not far from success. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Fu. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, technical expertise and at the same time, very practical uh, experiences uh, in uh, performing all those uh, monitoring programs. So uh, uh, we would like to stress again about the, what he had mentioned, Dr. Fu had mentioned about the proactive and uh, active monitoring approach uh, to be able to, to do the very good or complete flock health monitoring program in able to do a better uh, risk assessment management. Okay, so with that, uh, we have uh, some questions for you, Dr. Fu. Okay, mm -hmm. very interesting questions. And again, uh, for the others who still have uh, questions, please, uh, you, you may uh, write your questions in the chat box anytime, okay? So here's your very, very first question, Dr. Fu, because mm -hmm. you mentioned about uh, monitoring IB at day one, mm -hmm. at the age of uh, day one by ELISA. Uh, they, are, they want to know why, why you do monitoring for IB at day one through ELISA. Well, Any particular uh, in, reason or, or, yeah? In this preliminary study, actually, uh, we try to do more monitor than uh, the normal practice in the farm. So we want to know the maternal antibody status and after seven days of post-hatchery spray, does it really having any differences or not? So uh, this is just a side information but it's not a routine kind of uh, monitoring unless you think uh, IB variant or IB problem is a, is a real issue. You want to have your maternal antibody uniform and high enough, then you will monitor. So there must be a reason why. 
Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for that uh, clarification, Dr. Fu. So we have here another question for you. This is quite mm -hmm. long, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding your uh, experience about necrotic enteritis, do you have any research data on necrotic enteritis and uh, what to do with the emergence of uh, necrotic enteritis in a non-AGP era? Because I think necrotic enteritis is also very detrimental thing for the poultry business and uh is as a follow-up they're also he's also asking if there's already any vaccine available and uh what steps should be taken if and when necrotic enteritis becomes an outbreak i almost so have the run away. can you uh, you want me to repeat okay so first yes, question yes, maybe one by one, one. <laughs> Sorry. No yeah. one um, by one. There's a lot of questions. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, yeah. so do you, uh, what do you do with the emergence of a necrotic enteritis in a non-AGP yeah. area? Because they say yeah. it's also a very de detrimental thing in the poultry business. Yeah. Very good questions. Any uh, comment about it? <laughs> yes, uh, they're also ask, actually they're asking if there is a vaccine. Yeah. Um, I think uh, some country like Australia had, uh, you know, tremendous studies on necrotic enteritis and they find uh, certain uh, toxin forming uh, strain, the net V or, or alpha toxins, those, uh, those strains are not constantly uh, produced by certain strain. Sometimes uh, mm -hmm. certain strain it seems very pathogenic, but it can happen, you know, uh, be found in the very healthy frog, not a diseased frog. Some are very, very uh, sick with uh, necrotic enteritis, but they cannot find the net B forming uh, strain. So it makes the, you know, the studies are going on uh, so complicated until we are still learning how to control it uh we we are identifying what kind of uh, strain will be good candidates for va uh, vaccine production mm -hmm. uh, still i think yeah. uh, you know for monitoring it is also very very um, challenging because in the normal condition cost costridium species is still can be found in a healthy chicken so mm -hmm. i think uh constantly you know, uh, study the, the microbiota of the uh, chickens and also monitor closely from the... Um, what you can do actually is you do a backflow study. Um, more evidence actually is in the processing plant or, or, or when the mm -hmm. frog is getting... Uh, you know, that is more in, in the uh, broiler perspective and do some uh, lesion scoring or even uh, some uh, mortality scoring to relate to P uh, FCR and relate to the uh, feed that you're utilizing. Uh, maybe a company with different um, feed additive, uh, natural mm -hmm. uh, origin, herbal origin to, to find the differences. So, it's a very long topic, but just to cut it short, um, to maintain a, not a good gut health in combating the costridium is more of our strategy rather than uh, look, looking at one specific uh, costridium, one specific strain or something like that. So it is, I, I can only answer up to this level, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, in 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 uh, as a follow up to that, they they were asking whether you have any experience. Is there any available PCR or ELISA or other tests in relation to this uh, necrotic enteritis, based on your uh, field experiences? I'm sure there is something that you can you know work with uh, to certain uh, research institute or certain uh, professors they are interested with. But I think in commercially. You know, having a, a you know a product, a primers, and expect to to get a good uh, return, or you know, um, I think is not feasible. That's why I don't think uh, in the market they are much available. I can see 
the coming mm -hmm. availability of coccidiosis primer, but not uh, as a commercial, uh, mm -hmm. but not really uh, coccidium primer as a commercialized uh, product. Yeah. So. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So here's another question, Dr. Fu, for you. Um, which do you think is uh, which tool is more reliable between PCR and NDF ELISA in the OC if they have the vector ND vaccine at the hatchery to determine a good MD vaccination practices? <laughs> the Marex, I think, this one. Uh, do you have any idea about this or any general Actually, comment? <laughs> Actually, there are some people utilize the HVT primer to check for the uh, Marex, uh, this so-called um, vector vaccines or mm -hmm. recombinant vaccines. Yeah. Both are quite useful. It's up to you to, to choose. Maybe like Lou, maybe you have more experience than me comparing mm -hmm. the ELISA and also uh, PCR. Uh, that you can share with us, then uh, you are free to do that also. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, anyway, we will give uh, some more information to the customers asking this uh, since we still have a lot of questions for you, Dr. Fu. <laughs> we would like to maximize oh, okay. your short yeah. time yeah. here. <laughs> okay. So, here's hmm. another uh, question. Uh, based on your experience, uh, which sample is more reliable to identify? The successful Marex vaccination by PCR is it whether through feather pulp or through visceral organs? Feather pulp is enough because uh, visceral organ you need to kill the chicken. So I think feather pulp is very reliable. If you wait until fourteen days, it will be sure one hundred percent positive if the vaccine goes into the chicken. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you. Very straightforward answer. Yeah. And then another one here, we have, uh, he's asking, do you have any experience about IBD complex vaccine monitoring program? Well, basically there are many ways. ELISA is mm -hmm. good enough already. So um, I, I don't think uh, you need to do a PCR or lesion scoring, that kind of thing. I think ELISA is good enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another very specific uh, question here, Tata Fu. In uh, 50,000 flock, how many do you think, how many day old chicks is needed to test MG, MS by QPCR? Depends on how much money you have in your pocket. Just joking. <laughs> anyway, my experience in uh, uh, commercial layer that always uh, 70,000 per intake, 10 PCR is good enough. So normally, if you have uh, 50,000 10 PCR. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next. So do you, do you, do you pull uh, this, Dr. Uh, Fu, or you test it one by one? The samples, that the 10 you samples you have collected. Uh, maybe, maybe because what? You actually want to test the etiology agent. So it's no mm -hmm. problem for you to pull. But when you pull more samples, you're actually diluting the sample. So I think okay. three, five maximum is allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for that. Uh, here's another. Uh, here's a practical question. What sampling method can present the most realistic situation in the house? So maybe it's asking: Is it PCR or ELISA or the uh, bacterial monitoring or something like that? Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. You do not mention what type of disease, but still I I can manage to answer you. Go back to my slides. When you want to test something which is acute or recently happened, use mm -hmm. PCR. If you want to find a chronic uh, infections, you use ELISA. So I think both need to be utilized according to the disease onset and also clinical sign presentations or even egg production uh, drop, that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very crucial is the timing, yeah, the timing of samples to be able to know which particular uh, method you'd like to use. Yep. Okay, I think uh, we have here 
Another one. What monitoring and uh, sampling methods can be done if we find suspected SHS at the early laying to peak production? Okay. When solen head, uh, solen think, uh, head syndrome. Yeah, solen head syndrome, avian metapneumovirus. Mm -hmm. When you find that mm -hmm. yeah. clinical sign, the virus is already gone. Okay, the virus came in very, very early, very young, and it will create clinical sign, solen head, or something like a complication with uh, IBV. The time that you try to catch the virus by PCR is already gone. So always, I think to be uh, safe, you perform both. Okay, but I will put more weight in ELISA. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much for that. I think we still have uh, quite a few questions, but uh, anyway, all for all the questions that uh, have not been answered uh, directly by Dr. Fu, you can send all your questions uh, to us, any of the Asia team, and uh, we will uh, try to uh, coordinate with Dr. Fu and answer all your questions. Okay, so. Again, thank you very, very much, Dr. Fu, for uh, sharing uh, to us your very, very valuable time and uh, technical and practical experiences in the field. It's really uh, very good to have you uh, here with us, together with us.